exciting. Y'all, we have a baby dedication. This is, this, this is so adorable. Icebergs, I'm going to have you guys, if you're ready, bring baby Isaac up here. And uh, this is always a special time. If you haven't been to one of these, we actually refer to these as parent-child dedications. Because we're doing more than just dedicating a baby. We're dedicating the parents as well. And you have a part in this too. If you haven't seen baby Isaac, whose name means laughter, you are in for a treat. Psalm 127 verse 3 says this. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. And to that, I think we can all say amen. That is a gift. And this morning, we're not only going to dedicate Isaac, but we're going to dedicate the parents. So Rob and Candy are publicly saying that they want to raise their child in a Christ-honoring home. And they're asking for God's blessing today and for your support. So if you guys are ready. Oh, yeah. Is he asleep? Yes. That's so beautiful. Oh, my goodness. So we'll do a, a very quiet applause for little Isaac here. And uh, I'm so fired. You guys can stand right here if you want. Look at that. Hey, buddy. Don't just go back to sleep. Okay. It'll all be over soon. <laughs> Anytime we dedicate a baby or we have a parent-child dedication, this is a reminder to all of us that we are here to pass on a legacy of faith. We commit not only to the Lord, but we commit to each other that we are going to raise our children in honor and glory of the Lord. And we recognize that children are a gift from God. So Rob, Candy, I have a few questions for you. I've got three questions, very simple. And if you pledge your agreement to these, will you respond simply with, we do, okay? First question is this. Do you as Christian parents pledge that you will bring up your son Isaac in a Christian home, looking to God daily for wisdom, strength, and guidance? We do. And do you promise to give him every possible benefit of a safe and godly home, a great school, and a home church? We do. Amen. And thirdly, do you promise to pray with him and for him on a regular basis, realizing that it is only with God's hand on his life that he can be truly blessed by finding his purpose in him? We do. All right, church. You also have a responsibility and an honor in this to play a part in his life. Do you likewise recognize that children are a gift from God? Do you further pledge to demonstrate love, to pray for, not only for Isaac, but for his parents, and to offer your best example to them as we grow together in our walk with the Lord? If you agree, will you say we do? We do. All right. Now, we have a couple things for you today. We have our dedication certificate that you guys can, can take and frame. We also have a letter that I want to read to you, and you can give this to him when he's older. And I'll just share it with the whole church. I brought a copy of it that you can have. And if you'll just share this with him as he gets older and remind him of this day that his favorite pastor did all these, uh, these things. <laughs> the letter says this. It's from on behalf of the church. Dear Isaac, on this day, your parents came before the Lord and your church family here at the potter's hand to dedicate themselves and you to the Lord, the one they worship and serve. They recognize that you are a gift from God, and they give thanks to him for bringing you into their lives. They promise to train you in the things of God, looking to him for divine guidance, for wisdom, and for strength. They've asked God to bless your life and to make you a blessing to others as you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you with his power. Your church family has also promised to encourage your parents as they grow in the faith and to always be there for you when you need help living the Christian life that God has for you. Although you probably will not remember this day, I pray we will. And especially we will remember the vows we have made to the Lord on your behalf today. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus and grow up to live the life that pleases him. With our deepest love in our prayers, Pastor Matt and the Potter's Hand. And we have his very first Bible that has been made. This is a, we want to thank the Collins, Kim and Lee have a little monogram thing here. It's a beautiful bag, and inside is an inscribed Bible. I won't take all that out, but you guys can take that. And if it's okay with you, am I, can I hold them for a second? Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Get a quick picture of this, and then I'll pray a blessing. Oh, my goodness. Awesome. All right. Will you pray together with me? Lord, we thank you for this precious gift of Isaac. Thank you so much. We dedicate ourselves and our church to standing with him. Thank you 
for the encouragement he is already giving to our hearts this morning. I pray for his walk. I pray for his future mate. I pray for his life, for his protection, that he would shine bright for you. Lord, we ask for your wisdom. We ask for your guidance. We look forward to seeing what you will do through his life. May we all bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Church, may I present to you Isaac Carter Eisberg. Amen. I cannot think of a more perfect song as we celebrate 19 years. Can you believe that? Happy 19 years. When we started this church, I had hair. Some of you still was there anybody here on that very first day? Do we have a cut? All right, a cut. Yeah. Oh, look at you. Yes, yes, I see that hand. All right. Well, well, we'll come to that. Today, I'm here to declare God is so good. He is so faithful. I hope you feel that. I hope that no matter what season you are in today, you can sense that the Lord is so good. He is so faithful. What an honor to see him move over these past 19 years. And today, not one of us here will take any credit. It is all glory to God. He is so incredibly, immeasurably above what we can think or hope. He is awesome. And it's always fun to look back, at least, you know, every year or two, and remember where the Lord has brought us from, to see all that he's done. You know, we have seen so many lives changed. We've seen people saved. We've seen hundreds of people come to know the Lord, some baptized. This is just last month, right, just at Christmas time. We've seen so many marriages come together and be established. We've seen homes restored, lives changed, and broken homes come back to, to find healing, disciples made, missionaries supported, missionaries sent from here all around the world. And we've been able this past year to finally increase that local mission support. We've been able to come alongside a church over at Grace, Grace City that is just in such a, a, a desperate need of support for churches to come alongside them and, and to be a missionary in a dark part of, of our state. And, you know, God has been so good. By the way, Pastor Daniel already sent his regards and his congrats this morning. And I'm, I'm just so humbled to see how many people have chimed in on our Facebook just to wish you a congratulations. Because the reality is the days are growing darker. And there are churches by the thousands closing their doors. And God is pouring out his blessing at the same time. There's, you will see it. There is a great falling away that will happen. Many of you have already seen it. Maybe you've seen it in your own families. Maybe you've seen it at school. Maybe friendships that you've seen. God is going to be doing some of it. He is going to raise up a, 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 a remnant. And it is so important that no matter what you see in the news, you don't lose your faith. God is going to do some incredible things. One of the things we're so excited about is raising up these younglings that we see, like baby Isaac right here, all these little Padawan Jedi learners. We've got a, a school that we've finally been able to launch a dream from day one and over the next few months, they're setting it up with Leanne and some of these teachers coming on board to have up to 60 kids up here every single day hearing God's truth, pouring into them, raising up that, that next generation. What a lot of people don't realize is because God has been so good, we've been able to help churches and civic groups and fitness groups. Another preschool, there's a preschool that meets right next door in our East Campus that's Russian speaking. I mean, it's incredible the outreach that we are able to have because of your faithfulness, because of what God has done. And I'm excited to share what is going to happen in the near future, because four, five, maybe six other congregations that would have probably not made it, especially through the pandemic, are meeting here when we leave. Saturday, Sunday, Sunday nights, evenings, whenever the building is available, they're coming. And that has to please the Lord. It has to. We see the scriptures. We see that in, in Psalms where it says, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And I could go on and on. God has been so, so good. And great things lie ahead for us. So if you're new to the potter's hand, and maybe you haven't ever heard the backstory before, here's a quick recap, okay? We started this church to be a safe place where you could come. You don't have to put on airs. You don't have to dress fancy. We don't play dress up here. You, don't, you can be real. You can take your mask off. Ooh, that has a new meaning these days, doesn't it? You don't have to pretend to be anybody. You can wear one if you like, but it's all good. We just wanted to be authentic before the Lord. We just wanted to come and have a place where we focus on him and his word, where God's word does the judging and not us. I don't know about you, but every time I dive into his word, it convicts me and it challenges me. It encourages me. God's word does the judging for all of us. This is a place where we strive to live out those words that you passed as you came in, to love God, love people, 
and then as a result to go and serve God and serve people. But we wanted to be a little different and embrace simplicity. And a lot of people come and say, you guys are a little different. You're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> Everybody's different if you catch them at the right time. You know, at the potter's hand, we don't load up our schedules and endless events and destroy your home life with calendared events. And we value margin. We value a place we can come and slow down and dive into God's word where it's revered, where we gather, we worship him, we sing our hearts out. That is our highest priority. You know, a lot of people notice right away, we don't, we don't take up an offering here. There's no plates being passed. You'll never see that. In fact, we don't take anything by intention. God loves a cheerful giver. If he's blessed you and you want to return a portion of that as a thank you to his faithfulness, you'll see treasure chest. And that's what we do at the very beginning. We don't make a big fanfare of it. That's your worship time. You come and you give your gift. And that's it. And that's pretty much all we say about it. We want to be different. We know we're different. And that's okay because God has provided everything we need. You know, when all these churches I see, and some of them are great friends of mine, they're going towards this bigger and flashier and laser lights and fog machines and pyrotechnics and Vegas-style showgirls swinging on hula hoops from the chandeliers and all this stuff. It's just like, can we, can we go the other way? Can we embrace simplicity? Can we just, like, just let Jesus be enough? We don't have to compete with Vegas. We don't have to compete with Nashville. We can offer the one thing that the world truly needs, and that's Jesus. Just give me Jesus, a place where we can come and study his word, sing, worship, allow our families to come and know he is more than enough. We embrace the simplicity of the gospel. So if you've never heard that, we just kind of wanted you to know why we do what we do and why we don't do what we don't do, what a lot of other places do. So on our 19 year anniversary, I thought it's the perfect day to look back at the beginning and examine why we do what we do and see what God's word says to inspire that. All right, so go ahead and open your Bible to Matthew 22. You can pull up your favorite Bible app. Let me welcome our online campus and our guests that are at home. And uh, we're so glad that you can join us over the miles. Matthew 22, and again, let me set the context of what's happening here, because up to this point, the religious leaders are not happy with Jesus, <laughs> like at all. The Pharisees, the Sadducees. In fact, when we're about to see it, they are openly trying to trap Jesus now with like ridiculous questions. I'm talking off the wall stuff, stuff that is so funny, it sounds like a middle schooler made it up, almost as a Saturday Night Live joke. That's what, when you read this, it is almost laughable what they do. They're, they're intentionally, deliberately trying to trap Jesus now. It's, it, there's no pretense anymore of being like subtle. They are intentionally trying to trap him up and they're so slimy when they do it. It is so deceptive. They butter him up and they say things like this. Read along verse 15 with me. It says, teacher, but we know that you are truthful, and you teach truthfully the way of God, and you don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Right? It's, this, it's a trap question. You know it. They hold up a coin, right? And they're like, well, what do you think? You know, you can almost see them elbowing their neighbor, like, oh, we've got him now, Johnny. And they're, they're like, this is it, right? We're going we're gonna to finally get him. And I love Jesus' response. He sees right through their attempt to trap him. He is so far ahead of them. He's running circles around these so-called experts, and they don't even know it. And he does it so gently. It's just this little spank. He's so, he's so masterful. And he simply answers their question with a question of his own. Keep reading with me. Verse 18. So perceiving their malicious intent, Jesus says, why are you testing me, hypocrites? <laughs> I love it. He can get away with that. Show me the coin used for a tax. Look at that. He puts it right back on him. They brought him a denarius. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked him. Well, Caesar's, they said to him. Then he said, this is, this is genius. Well, then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but give to God the things that are God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and they went away. All right, now picture this. This is important, okay? This is all coming down to why we do what we do. There's something huge about to happen. We've got the Sadducees. They've come up to him and... The, the Pharisees have just struck out. They just, boom, totally, totally whiffed on it. Now the Sadducees come up, like it's their turn, okay? The, the other rival gang, if you will. And I can kind of picture them almost like they're elbowing their way past the, these rivals. And I can't help it. Every time I read passages where the Sadducees and the Pharisees get up, I always picture some horrible version of an off-Broadway musical version of, of West Side Story, right? You've got the Sadducees over here with the ball, and you've got the Pharisees who are just ready to rumble. And they're, they, they think they're tough. 
but they come up and they're like, oh, you want to go? You want to go, right? And they're scared because they know the high priest is there and they can't fight in front of the high priest. So they say, all right, that's it. We're going to go meet under the stadium. If you come with me, we're going to rumble and we're going to go fisticuffs, right? So the Sadducees and the Pharisees are duking it out, but they never do. They can't lay a finger on Jesus. And they're kind of doing this thing, right? And it's like, well, oh, you want to go? You want to go? You, you, you go, right, right? And for whatever reason, it always seems like nothing ever happens between these. And Jesus just puts them in their place. So you've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and now it just turns into a dance-off. They have this moment, and I never, I always picture like, whoo, ha, and they're doing it. And Jesus is so not impressed, right? This is what I picture, okay? This is, this is how weird your pastor is. This is the mental picture I get. The Sadducees come up, and they try to stump the Savior. I mean, you could actually read it. We'll, we'll skip the verses, but the, the summary of it, they come up and they say, oh, teacher, if a man dies and his wife survives, and, but the man had a brother, and the brother marries her so that they can have children on behalf of the brother that died, but he dies, and then another brother comes up and marries her, and they have kids, and he dies, and, then another, and this happens seven times. Like, true story. If this happens, who is going to be married to her in the resurrection? <laughs> We've got him now. And his response is the best just slice. They don't even know they're bleeding. He says, you're wrong because you don't know the scriptures. He's saying this to experts. He's saying this to Pharisees, Sadducees, to high priests, who knows there. And he's like, you don't know the scriptures. Have you not read? He says, I am the God of the living. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not the God of the dead. And they're just, they are stunned. And so he's sitting there turning all these things over right on their, on their heels, and the crowds are starting to be astonished. And that does not make the Sadducees happy, or the Pharisees. All right? Check out their reaction. Follow along with me, starting at verse 34. <clears throat> he says this. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. You see, Jesus is uniting two rivals, right? He's bringing people together already. He brings these together. Then they all come up, and one of them, an expert in the law, asks a question to test him again. Uh, teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? You can almost see a patent on the back. Like, yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Family feud. Which, what, what's he got? Got it? Look at his response. He said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. Oh, the second one's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the law, all the law, all the prophets depend, literally hang on these two commands. So there it is. This is why we do what we do. Love God, love people. And thereby we go and we serve God and we serve people. Jesus, in just a few short sentences, is not only able to silence these spastic critics, he's able to cut through the noise and the clutter and reveal your purpose. 2,000 years later, you want to know why you're here? There it is. You want to know what gives you motive to get out of bed and put your feet on the floor and go, this is it, to love God and love people, to serve others with all your heart, pointing people to him, loving your neighbor as yourself. Don't miss that. It's very intentional. The first thing he does is he directs us upward. He wants us to love God. This is your first motivation when the sun comes up, and it is no accident that he does something here. We miss it because we're not Jewish in history like this. He is saying, love God with your heart, soul, and mind. See, what we forget to the Jewish people back then, these represented the whole person. They, they had a totally different way of looking at, at the human spirit. These aren't like three separate categories to them. Okay? So to mention all of these, Jesus is not leaving anything to chance. He is saying, guys, love God with everything in your being. Your day should be one of all-consuming passion." To serve the Father. He's not leaving anything to chance. Think about that. This is your all-consuming fire. When you wake up, this is the driving force in your life, day in and day out. So you know I gotta ask. How you doing with that? Go back a day, maybe two days. Don't say anything to your neighbor. Would you say, looking back on this last week, that you are living with an all-consuming desire to love God with your heart, mind, soul? Here's your purpose. Not only does he say there, he goes on. He directs us outward to love people. And I love how he does this so seamlessly as if to say, hey, guys, listen up. You know you're supposed to love God. That's great. You're doing pretty good with that, but that's not enough. Naturally, that is supposed to lead now to a love for people. 
So how are you doing with that? Naturally, you are supposed to do that. They are made in his image, you and I. These two laws are interconnected. They literally hang on each other. You can't have one without the other. You can't separate them. You need to not only love God, but you need to love your neighbor. You're not supposed to hate your neighbor. They like to add that part, but that's not what Jesus said. He actually corrects that later. He says, love your enemies. He's going through, and they're blowing their mind. They're just like, what do you say? What people forget is he's actually quoting an ancient rabbi, Rabbi Kenobi, who says, what happens to one affects the other. It forms a symbiotic circle. Surely you understand this. Some of you know what this is. Even the Jedi get this. Love God. Love people. How are you doing with that? What do your neighbors think? When they look at you, what kind of God do they see? What about your classmates? I love we got so many younglings here. What do they think when they see your reactions? When a teacher says do something, like, ah, and everybody's whining and complaining. People with jobs. How about your boss? When he gives you an assignment. Or when he asks you to maybe fudge the numbers just a little. It's tax season. Come on. It'll help out our bottom line. Y'all, we're called to holiness. Not to be arrogant, but just, just to be holy, to be humble, to follow the way of Jesus. This is our mission statement. Jesus, in just a few short sentences, summarizes the entire law. The wisdom of the ages is boiled down to its essence. Love God, love people. This is why we do what we do. And I'm so grateful for what God is doing in our church. As these days grow darker, we have to be that lighthouse. I look at the adults and the small groups, Roy, Bill, and Amy's class, all of them growing like a weed. They, I found out today they had to actually bring out extra chairs just to cram them in a room so that they could meet and study God's word. Who does that? People who love Jesus, apparently. They show up. Our youth show up on Sundays, Wednesdays. Remember, they could choose to be anywhere. They drive now. I mean, that's scary. They drive now. And they chose to come here Sundays, Wednesdays, all week long. Our West Campus overflowing with younglings. And Marin and Leanne, their amazing staff, their volunteers, going to be opening it up to handle 60 kids this fall. I look and I see where we've come from, and I just want to stop and say, glory to God. That is incredible. Y'all, we're going to need all hands on deck because we've got to make some changes to make room for this. And that's where you come in. I know some of you couldn't help but notice some bright green posters on the wall. So you have a chance. To make room, we need your help. We are going to repurpose the entire East Campus, and we are going to make that now the youth annex. And we are bringing all the adult classes to this building, OK? So Bill's class and Roy's class is going to meet in the second room on the left. That's the room we have the 10, 10, 10 prayer time in. That's going to stay there. They don't have to race over here. We don't have to worry about being late and stuff. The older youth can be down there, and middle schooler is going to be awesome. Pray for Colin. He gets to keep them in line over there. And we're going to have to repurpose some things. And we have six weeks to get it done before Palm Sunday. All right? It is going to be incredible. Our student ministry, I'm so glad to finally give them a place because they are being poured into their lives and seeing the, the growth. Just, just as a dad with teenagers, I love when they come home and they're sharing the truth that they're hearing seeing the young kids quoting Bible stories and scriptures that I didn't even learn until seminary age. It is so incredible. God is on the move. One of the things they're doing here coming up, they're going to Winter Jam, and you guys have a chance to bring some friends. This is an awesome chance. This is an entry, a gateway experience. We've got some lost neighbors. We're praying that they will come to this. Make, mark it down and make it an appointment that you guys say, hey, we got to do something like this. we got to get them here. we got to fill their minds with truth. God is doing such a powerful work. 1 Timothy 4.12 says this, Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And I'm so thankful that God is raising up a faithful generation who strives to be like this. Aren't you? Man, God bless them. Keep up the good work. We're so excited. Our welcome team, even our worship, our tech team, killing it every day. These are doing the unseen, often never even noticed uh, dedication to the Lord. I'm so thankful for that. The, the same can be said for our prayer team at 1010 every Sunday interceding for you, for me, faithfully, week after week. That's where our power lies. It's not in our flesh. 
I'm so thankful for their dedication and their unseen ministry to the Lord. Today we celebrate another year of God's faithfulness. All right? So from the early days, there were just a handful of us meeting in a frozen basement down under an old library at Cary Christian School before they moved. You can even see with the shiny, silky shirt I have with the red sleeves, my full head of hair for those who have never met me with that. And from those days, we went to a smelly, sticky-floored middle school cafeteria where even the CIA could not identify what those smells were or what sticky substances we were all... As you walk through, we sat on those little green round disc chairs that had no back. All right? I don't want to ever hear complaining about chairs <laughs> again. We went through that, and then God finally provided a more permanent place to serve. He has been so good. I literally am struggling to wrap my head around 19 years. 19 years. We are here for such a time as this. Potter's hand, it is not an accident we are here. It's not an accident. We are one of the few that is not only surviving, but is thriving. God gets the credit. He is pouring out his blessing. And there is a reason. I'm so optimistic about the future. As I've been praying about this, I know hey, we've had awesome days, but our best days are still ahead. And I believe the reason he is pouring out his favor is because God is good. He is generous and he is faithful. And as a result, you are trying to be generous and faithful and live a life of righteousness. I look around and I see such a need for revival and harvest. We are the lighthouse. The harvest is so ripe. So please, stay faithful with your time. Stay faithful with your talents. Stay faithful with your treasure. Don't take your foot off the gas now. We need all hands on deck. All right, so here's what we're going to do in the very near term. Over the next six weeks, leading up to Easter, we're going to go full steam ahead. As we prepare for that big day where we have the most people that have ever come and most lost people, this is where families are, are usually able to, and open and receptive to hear the gospel, we usually have a service day to prepare for this. It's bigger than that. We're going to have a service month, okay? But here's what we're going to do. Instead of having one day, we're going to have team leads on each of these posters, and you're going to have a chance to sign up for what's good for you. You get to pick the day. You get to pick the time that works for your schedule because a lot of people can't make just one particular window. So we are going to open this up. And as we pray and invite our lost friends and our neighbors to our big Easter celebration, I want us to be ready to receive them and to receive them with excellence, okay? We have hundreds of people up here every week now, thousands over the course of the last 11 months. And if you look closely, you will know there's a lot of things that need some touching up. Some things are just tired. Some things are worn out. Some things need replacing. Uh, some of you have been incredible with private donations. Uh, just last year, we had that huge refrigerator in the kitchen. It was 18 years old, like an original. And it died sometime during the night, maybe a couple weeks ago. And when it did, the, uh, it was not the Holy Ghost. There was some kind of smell emanating from that. That It was, it was like something come. We, at first, we were like, what's that? And then we're like, oh my goodness. We opened it, and some of you knew it was time. We played taps, gave it a burial and you helped us get a brand new fridge, little things like that. You're going to have an opportunity for something big in just a minute. All right, I'll, let me walk you through a few of these things and um, see how we're doing on time because I want to make sure we, we leave time to eat here. Our children in our preschool. Last year, we were able to do a whole bunch in the east wing or the west wing back here. Painted. We don't have to do a whole lot of painting this time, but we do have something huge that we are going to be blessed with. Uh, while there'll be less painting, we need some more stuff on the outside. Many of you know that uh, we've been using wood chips and mulch, and it's been attracting the fire ants and all kinds of stuff. So we have a gift that someone has gone in halves with us and purchased blue rubber mulch. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's awesome. It's rubberized. It's made from recycled rubber, and it's spongy, resists ants, and it resists runoff and all these things. We just need to get it there to the playground, all right? I don't know if we're going to have to remove something. This is so far out of my, uh, my realm of comfort. I don't know. But if you are willing to do that, you don't mind working outside. We're going to do something. But here's the new part. As many of you know, we have had a residential grade play set for the last four years. And we have been doing our best to nurse it along. In fact, I think Donald Rose alone has single-handedly tightened every bolt for four years, replaced broken boards, restained it. But the time has finally come. It has given up the ghost. I thought we were going to have to come and take it down, but God has been so faithful, and Leanne has been sending me these incredible emails. 
we are going to be able to replace it with a fully functional professional grade that handles ages 2 to 12 that will have like a 20 year life. Not only will they come and install it and cement it and take care of it, they have agreed we don't have to touch the old one. They will come disassemble it and haul it off for us. So that is a blessing. And they gave us a discount when they found out it was a church. So isn't God good? This is incredible. Now, some of you may not be able to help do mulch. You may not be able to help do stuff with fencing or some of the bushes and stuff that we need every year. And you think, oh, I'd love to do something. Or maybe you're watching at home and, and you're thinking, how can I contribute? This is not your typical $900 Walmart special that we all have in our backyard, okay? It's a professional grade and the cost reflects that. You want something that's safe for preschools and for lots of use over the years, the cost will reflect that. So if you want to make a donation to a specific thing, you want to know exactly where your contribution is going, we are opening up a temporary fund for this, all right? All you have to do is write playground on the memo or if you're online and you're sending something in, just put playground and Linda will know exactly where that goes, okay? This would be awesome if we could have this funded because they are willing to do this this week? Wednesday? Is that what? Wednesday. All right? So we don't have to do the mulch before Wednesday. We're going to get that in and we'll handle that. Uh, all right, so let me walk through these and I'm going to tell you a few of the other things that we can sign up for. First poster on the left. This one is the former youth room demolition. If you haven't seen the youth room, second door on the right, do not demolish the first room. That's Pastor Jason's office. Second one, on the right, there are some wooden benches that have been built to withstand Hurricane Cat 5, maybe. So we either need to remove them or bless another family with them. They open up. They're made out of two-by-fours. They're really heavy. we got to get those out. So um, if you're up for that, there's also ceiling tiles that they've had an awesome time painting over the years and making them customized to their kind of personality traits. we got to take those down, replace those with the new white ones. We'll have all the supplies for you. We also want to remove the dry erase boards, shelves, there's uh, Christmas lights and some uh, chalkboards and stuff. All that's got to come up so we can prep it for painting, all right? This is kind of the demolition team. So if you're kind of like, woohoo and wild, this is your thing. If you want to be a team lead and you don't mind kind of spearheading this and calling the people who volunteer, say, hey, what's a good night? When can we come? We'll make sure you have all your supplies ready, everything that you need so you don't have to waste any time. Get your key, make sure you're in, okay? Next one, the former youth room. This is the Scrabble room across from the other big youth room where the 10, 10, uh, 10 prayer time happens. We are going to re-carpet, or actually take the carpet out of both of those rooms, the youth room and the Scrabble room. And we are going to need someone who doesn't mind getting that carpet up. And we gotta haul that off. We also wanna install new ceiling tiles in that room uh, and ch uh, change the lights, all the fluorescent lights. We need to replace those. And then if somebody's very aggressive, we need someone, if they know how to install LVP flooring, those little planks that kind of look like that wood grain over there on the pH wall, uh, we'll have that here for you. If you're good at that, that would be awesome. I don't want to have to pay people to do that. We've got some people who have hinted they would like to help. Free miscellaneous. Okay, this is if you're not sure where you want to go and you just want to help, then sign up on here because we can put you in all kinds of places where we are having the need most. We need to remove that huge bulletin board in the hallway by the water fountains. Haha, <laughs> remember. That thing is a beast. Not sure how structurally thing that is attached. So if you're good, maybe you want to be a carpenter or have some skills with that. Probably a couple people for that. We want to take that down. We want to fill in the holes and we're going to repaint that whole wall. Paint prep. Uh, if you're good with trimming out or putting up the tape, that would be fantastic. Put me where needed, coach. There's another one if you just want to be available for whatever we lack. Relocate some furniture, paint, touch up paint. One of the things we're doing is we are moving our finance office into what was the conference room, so it's lockable now. And that opening lobby is going to be a massive youth center welcome. They have, uh, can I say it? John Arthur is building an incredible farm table. I've seen pictures of it. It holds 12 people around. It's one of them tall ones. Got charge. Oh, it's awesome. Go to Cadova and you'll see something that looks kind of like it. It's going to be there in the front lobby. We're going to move the desk and all that stuff out. We have a conference table that's in that room. We want to donate. If you know someone we can bless with that, please let us know. We would love to bless somebody. It's a huge, heavy, very sturdy conference table. We've got to get that out. Uh, paint. We want to repaint that wing as well. Outside work. We saw the playground mulch. If you're willing to do that, you'll sign up here. Uh, we've got some bushes to, to always trim. They keep eating up our entryways and just makes it kind of choke. Cleaning windows, some of the simple stuff like that. All right, so team leads are the colored part of each one of these posters. If you can fill that in, and uh, then we will be in touch. What we're going to do is I'm going to call Priscilla up in just a second. We're going to pray, 
And then we're going to take a group photo of us, because we've never done one before. We're going to have a celebrate to remember this moment. And then we will break and have our lunch, give you a chance to take a Sharpie, and go sign up on all of those wonderful opportunities. All right. God is on the move. Recap. Don't lose hope. Can't wait for what is coming down the pipe. And uh, I just got a text, and I wanted to share this with you. I thought this was so cool. Uh, I probably should have asked permission to share it live, but it's okay. I'm going to do it anyway. See if you can guess who this was from. Good morning, Pastor Matt. Just wanted to send a quick congratulatory note on the 19th anniversary for Potter's Hand Bible Church. You, Amy, your family have faithfully answered the call while illuminating love for the people in our community. Apex is truly a better place thanks to you and your church and those who continue to give themselves away to be used by God so that others can live in peace. Your love for God is pure. Thank you for running the race to plant and sustain Potter's Hand Bible Church for 19 years now. Please know that I will be cheering for you all for another 19 plus years. Keep up the great work. Love you, sir. God bless you, your family. Have a joyous day. Sincerely, your brother with the same hairstyle, Mayor Jacques Gilbert. Y'all remember? Yep, yep, yep. I thought that was pretty cool to have that. That, that, that greeted me early in the morning, and uh, I don't think he would mind at all. But uh, people are noticing you. We wanted to be the church that if we ever had to close the doors, even the lost world would be bummed. That's powerful. I may not know what they do. I may not know their God. I may not know what they, But look how they love each other. That's what I want to be known for.